Hello, my name is John Lispin, and here you see me uh, trying to implant a thought with this ray gun. Uh, I'm not a cognitive psychologist. I know many of you are interested uh, in cognitive psychology and using functional imaging uh, to study the brain and using transcranial magnetic stimulation to uh, in affect brain processing. But uh, I actually am interested in something quite different, and I hope I can get you interested uh, in that area of research. So when I was a graduate student, uh, I was very influenced by David Marr, and he started a, a, a new field and a new way of looking at brain function, uh, which I very much liked. And what he studied was uh, some of the anatomy, uh, notably uh, the work of the eminent uh, anatomist uh, Cajal. Cajal used the Golgi method and could finally see the individual cells that make up the brain. The reason that his technique called the Golgi method worked was that it fully stained the cell, but only a very small fraction of the cells. And so what you could see uh, is uh, samples of the cells in an otherwise very dense collection of, of cells. And so the kind of picture that he produced is shown here, and this is the hippocampus, a region of the brain that's involved in memory. So I've labeled uh, some arrows, one, two, three. The label, I'll go number one, is a region of the hippocampus, which is the input region called the dentate gyrus. And you can see the label pointing to some small cells. And they send their axons, uh, which are labeled here too, uh, over to a region of the hippocampus with much larger cells called the CA3 region. Now the third arrow is actually axons of the CA3 region cells. And what you see is that the axons actually cross over the dendritic region of other CA3 cells. And it is this aspect of anatomy which really influenced Amar, and he led to some proposals about what the connections between CA3 cells might be doing uh, for memory. In this slide, I've given you a much cleaner view of the wiring diagram of the hippocampus. And on the right, you can see the CA3 region. And if you follow the green arrows from the cell bodies to the right and then up and then curving left, these are called the recurrent connections of CA3. And those axons make synapses onto other CA3 cells. And what I'd like to now explain to you is uh, ideas first developed by Marr, but uh, then by others, about what this particular architecture might be about. Why do axons from CA3 cells make synapses with the dendrites of other CA3 cells? Well, the basic idea is that this can this type of network can form associative memories. So for instance, if, I, if you see a person and learn their name, you might build the association of the face with the name using a network like this. So let me see if I can explain to you how it works. Well, while both the face and the name are present during learning, these two particular cells with the black arrows pointing to them would be active. And by a synaptic plasticity rule, which you may have heard of, the HEB rule, if the input to a cell is active and the cell itself is active, those synapses will be strengthened. And at the recurrent synapses shown here during learning, if you present it with the face and the name, both the face cell and the name cell would be coactive, leading to an 
strengthening of the specific synapses which connect the face and the name. Well, now that those synapses are strengthened, what good are they? Well, it turns out that there's a fantastically important process called pattern completion. So, for instance, if now somebody shows you the face and the, and the name cells are not active, the fact that the synapses between the face and the name cells have been strengthened will now cause the name cells to become active. So that is the amazingly important function of the synapses uh, of the recurrent connections. They can make, uh, they, they use associative memory to do the process of pattern completion. Can you test that? And Susuma Tonagawa of MIT did a, a, an amazing experiment where he presented a partial pattern uh, to a rat after the rat had learned a complete pattern and showed that the rat could, could behave normally, presumably because the CA3 filled, region filled in the missing pieces of the pattern. In contrast, when he inactivated learning in the CA3 by knocking out the NMDA receptors that are necessary for synaptic plasticity at those recurrent synapses, then the animal could not behave appropriately given only the partial pattern. And this turns out to be relevant to another aspect of the architecture of the hippocampus, which is shown in this slide. So if you look at the cells, uh, in the green cells, and especially the light green cells, you will see that they send their axons back to the dentate gyrus. So what good could this be? And this is where uh, I developed some ideas uh, about what this could be good for, but I developed those ideas based on some important foundational work done by Heim Sampolinski, who's pictured here. And what Heim was curious about was how you would build a nerve network that not only stored one memory and the associations that are part of that memory, but also stored a sequence of memories. So for instance, you came into the room, you opened your book, then you remember that you talked to the person next to you, then uh, the professor started the class. So you have an image of a sequence of events in your memory. And what Heim pointed out was that the simplest of networks depicted here at the top, where by, by point A, uh, just don't work very well. And so in those simplest networks, there's just a chaining process where memory A stimulates memory B, which stimulates memory C, which stimulates memory D. But what he pointed out was that you know that, there's going to, that this isn't going to work well because when nerve networks perform, they always make some minor errors. And we symbolize that here by the, putting a prime next to B. So that means that parts of B would be missing because the nerve networks don't work perfectly. But now if you use that imperfect form of B to try to stimulate the next memory in the sequence C, what you know is that the C that's produced will be even more imperfect. And when C tries to trigger memory D, it'll be even more imperfect. So you get this buildup of errors. So how could you avoid that? Well, Sampolinsky was well aware, as, as, as shown here in line B, that memory B, if degraded, could be fixed by an auto-associative mem memory. The missing pieces could be filled in to make a B. And so the general idea that Sampolinsky proposed was that there were two kinds of networks which worked together with, to perform perfect memory recall. So you chain from A to B, but you make some errors, so we call it B prime. But then you send that degraded version of B over to an auto-associated network, which does the 
fixing of and converts, fills in the missing pieces, converts B prime to B. Then the nice pristine B is sent over to the chaining network, where B chains over to C, but again produces some errors, and therefore we label this C prime. But now you can go back and forth between the networks, always fixing and cleaning up, and then sending back to the chaining network. And so in the end, you can get all the way to D without the accumulation of errors. Well, I thought that given the evidence that the hippocampus is able to recall memory sequencing, that there must be some secret within this architecture about how that memory recall of sequences would be performed. And my suggestion is that the light green connections that you see here that go back to the dentate gyrus are the connections which will take a memory in the CA3, let's say it's B, and chain so to the next memory, i.e. D, in the dentate gyrus. And now that memory has some errors and is sent over to the CA3 region. As I told you, CA3 can clean up the errors. And so now if you convert C prime with errors to a pristine version of C without errors, and now the information is sent back to the dentate to trigger the next memory in the sequence D. And so by ping-ponging the information back between dentate and CA3, it's possible to recall uh, a, a sequence accurately. So this is a very exciting idea, which now needs to be experimentally tested. One way to test that would be to see whether the memory for sequences is destroyed or attenuated by inactivating uh, the dentate gyrus during memory recall. Unfortunately, there are very exciting new methods that are, are making that kind of experiment possible. So in summary, I, I hope I've convinced you that there is the exciting prospect for looking at the structure of nerve networks and actually seeing how they perform a cognitively important function.